Okay, so um, you were all here a little while ago, so you got the context. So now we're going to move into like maybe more specific kinds of strategies in terms of talking about co-teaching. How many of you are already co-teaching? How many do, hands do we have? Is there some way for the people in the audience to actually convey that too? Or not? Okay. Okay, so in our audience, it looks like it's about two-thirds of the audience either are or have co-taught before, so that's good, because I want you guys to offer lots of ideas and strategies. Before I get into really looking at the co-teaching, the specific co-teaching strategies, I want to open with um, talking a little bit about the notion of collaboration. Are all of you familiar with this particular Google website? This is like a very cool website. It's called Wordle, W-O-R-D-L-E. You just Google in Wordle, and when you have brainstorm sessions, whether it's with staff or whether it's with kids, whatever, you generate a list of words, and then you type them in. You have to type them on a Word doc, and then you upload it into Wordle. And what it does is it automatically creates for you the larger words are the words that were more frequently cited. The smaller words were less frequently cited. It's a great way to get staff to start looking at. And you don't have to use collaboration. You could use whatever concepts you want. You could use co-teaching. You could use whatever, accommodations, differentiation, whatever. And have people generate what their ideas are around it. Um, I actually do it in our uh, one of our classes that we offer at the university that's the intro class to special education that is taken by elementary, secondary, and preschool teachers as well as special ed. And do it at the beginning of the quarter and then at the end of the quarter so they can see their own differences, their own learning. So all the words in the beginning are all dis. They're all the dis words. All the can't do, you know, because they're talking about disabilities and it's all the dis. But then at the end of the quarter, you start, you start to see the empowerment words. You start to see the positive um, terminology. So anyway, I just wanted to put that up there to share that with you. Um, I want to start by talking a little bit about listening. And there is a website up here, but I'm, I mean a YouTube video, but I'm going to run out of time if I show all these YouTube videos. So I'm going to skip some of them. But I have the URL so you can refer to it. These slides, as well as my slides from lunch, are up on the, what is it called, Edmundo? Ed, Ed, Edmodo, Edmodo. Um, so you can download them and, and get them for your own sake. But I want to start by talking about listening. I've probably attended in my career probably close to 1,000 IEP meetings at different times for different reasons. And I think the bottom line is where we break down is when we're not listening, when we're there t because we have an agenda and we have to go through the agenda. Or nowadays it's really with the laptop because everything's on the laptop now. And we're so focused on the structure of the schedule of the meeting that we aren't necessarily listening. So I, a couple of things that I think are really important in terms of listening. I see you. I see your beauty, your creativity, your strength, and your magnificence. When we listen to each other, that's the message we're giving to somebody else. Um, I see your shining light. You are a blessing in my life. I see you. That's the message we give when we intently listen. And there's a difference between listening to get ready to now counter what somebody has said versus listening and really listening and taking in. One of the things that I worry about for parents is that since they don't always have, especially when their children are preschoolers, they don't have the educational language. They don't know the words that we've kind of gotten to know and we use and we throw around at IEP meetings all the time because they aren't part of that. And so when they communicate, it's kind of like, OK, talk, and then let's move on to the next agenda item. Rather than talk, listen, have a conversation about it. And I know it does slow the process down, but it is so important. So listening plays a critical role in establishing relationships that are based upon mutual trust and harmony. And so when people feel like we listen, whether we're in co-teaching arrangements, whether we're at an IEP meeting, whether we're just having an interaction with a parent who's dropping their child off, that we're listening in that way that actually conveys that we're trying to build that mutual trust. The art of active listening. 
There, there's a wonderful book um, called, oh shoot, I'm so bad about, I know the color of it, but I know that will help you. Um, Mark Nepo is the author, I do remember that, and it's 10,000 Ways of Listening. And it, it's not a book full of bulleted points that says here are the 10,000 ways. It's really a wonderful book about really doing that deep listening and using that deep listening experience to be able to be part of the co-teaching arrangements and all others. But these are things I actually got from, um, from Mark's book. So you guys can take a look at that, um, see if that resonates with you in terms of where we actually hold the IEP meetings, where we have those co-planning sessions when we're, co when we're building our co-planning. Are we doing it in such a way that we're creating that kind of welcoming atmosphere? Because active listening requires all of those things that are up there on that slide right now. And I'm not going to read them to you because I want to get to the co-teaching piece. The word, this is so interesting. Have you heard this before? The word listen contains the same letters as the word silent. That's not a mistake, I don't think. I, don't, I, I really believe in serendipity, that things happen for a reason. And there's a reason why listen has the same letters as silent. True listening. Um, we have been given two ears but a single mouth in order that we may hear more than ta and talk less. <laughs> hear more and talk less. The most basic and powerful way to connect to another person is to listen. Just listen. Perhaps the most important thing we ever give each other is really our attention. These are all critical, essential prerequisites to building those co-teaching relationships and co-teaching partnerships and also for building our relationships with parents. One way to listen is to keep what is true before us. So the, the truth of what we know is, is always there. So, so the guy says to, the, <laughs> to his wife, what were you saying? My inner voice drowned, drowned you out for a second. <laughs> Thanks for listening. OK, collaboration can result in creativity. Oh, this is also a wonderful YouTube video, but you can look at it on your own. Because if I do this, I'm not going to be able to get through the presentation. So co-teaching between general and special education teachers. And I, I think that when it comes to early childhood, it's often, in some ways, easier than it is in K-12, and in some ways, more challenging. Easier because. I think that preschool, the preparation for preschool teachers and the preparation for preschool, preschool special ed teachers is more similar, more aligned, more, more connected in many ways. So the conversation is such that each understands each other much better than certainly in the K-12 system. More difficult for early childhood because often, as I said earlier, it's a different governance structure often. So you've got a Head Start teacher who works for perhaps the County Office of Education. You might have a local school district early childhood special educator who works for a different entity and together they're going to create this collaborative environment. If we aren't careful, they perhaps have different holidays. They have different times that kids get dropped off and picked up. And so if we haven't done some of that work that really creates cohesion between the two programs, it's difficult for us, it's more difficult for us to figure out how to move that together. So in some ways, like in the, in the idea that preschool and preschool special ed has more similar connection in terms of the methodology that's used to prepare those personnel, but the difficulty comes in the different governance structures. And the truth is, the difficulty still comes sometimes when the governance structure is the same. So we both work for, we're both county teachers. We both work for the same county. And still sometimes that, that gets in the way of being able to, to do collaboration or co-teaching. So characteristics of, of co-teaching, it's two professionals. It could be more than two, but it's at least two professionals who are working together. Likely you might have instructional aides who are also involved in the co-teaching arrangement and relationship. Another really important piece, because at, if, if a preschool general ed teacher has not had paraeducators, they maybe had some parent volunteers, but haven't had paraeducators, they might not understand that relationship and that role. We sometimes as special educators probably should go back and remind ourselves, what did we have to learn in order to work with paraeducators? Because the, sometimes that's as big of a challenge, if not more so sometimes, than working with the children. 
It's a joint delivery of instruction. It means we're going to do our instruction together. It doesn't mean that we're going to stand next to each other and teach the class. It just means that we're going to agree on delivering the instruction for the whole class. And it may be that I break, we break the class up into smaller groups. We may do any number of things, but we're going to agree on the fact that it's a joint delivery of instruction. It's a diverse group of students. It's, it, 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 in California, it's always a diverse group of students. But this sometimes brings a greater dimension because of the presence of students with disabilities. And then the, the tough one is the shared classroom space, because whose classroom is it? Whose cubbies are it? You know, who, where do I put my purse? Where do I put, where, where do I put my instructional materials? Can I use some of the paper from the Head Start program to actually cut out some things that are going to be accommodations for kids with disabilities? You know, where, those, those kind of conversations need to occur so that when I pull a piece of paper off the shelf that's not technically I, paid for by the system I'm paid for by, that there's not going to be hysteria coming up. That we've agreed on what are some of our mechanics and how we're going to work with each other. And so co-teaching, components of co-teaching, establishing a co-teaching relationship. It doesn't happen overnight. On the other hand, this is not a marriage. I know that a lot of co-teaching partners will say, it feels like a marriage. And if they went that far, great. And they built that kind of strong, really mutual, respectful relationship. That's terrific. But it doesn't have to be. And so what we don't want to do is create the sense that you all have to like love each other, you know, that you all have to just walk away as best friends. Because perhaps best friends is not part of the agenda, and that's okay. But again, all that has to be talked about pretty up, pretty up front. And un identifying individual students' needs. And, and the piece that I love about this is that as, as special educators, the kids on my caseload, I have these individual kids with a lot of individual unique needs. It's, it's likely that there are some kids on the general ed caseload who have some of those same kind of needs. But we haven't seen it that way always. So we want to make sure that we're talking about the whole class individual needs. This should not be just about the kids who have identified IEPs. One of the rules of thumb I always tell teachers is no one child's education should ever be done to the sacrifice of another child. I do believe that peer groups are great, they're wonderful, but every child needs to have instructional purposes for being there. So when my son was in, when my younger son was in third grade, he still wasn't reading. And you know, that was definitely a challenge. So the reading specialist decided she wanted them to practice reading, but it would have been age inappropriate to pick up, particularly the, doc, the Dr. Seuss books, which are kind of kindergarten age books. But she decided what she would do is, she, all the, they were like four kids in the third grade class who weren't reading, like fluently reading third grade text at this point. So she assigned each one of them to be a tutor of a kindergartner. So their job, and, they, and she made badges for them, just like your badges. She, so if they were walking around the school, somebody wouldn't stop them because they were off now to the kindergarten classroom. And their job was to read a Dr. Seuss book ahead of time. And she gave them a lesson plan format. So she had them fill in, like, what were the purpose of the lesson? What were the objectives? What were going to be the steps you were going to use? And that was their homework, so they would get ready. And then they got paired with a kindergarten student they built a relationship with. And the truth is, all four of those kids by the end of third grade had taken that experience and that confidence level and applied it to their literacy development that was now more age appropriate third grade work. So it gave them an excuse to read first kindergarten books without making them look funny. You know, because if they're carrying a book around school and it's a Dr. Seuss book, the other third graders are likely to make fun of them. So this gave them an excuse. And it was a, there was a big deal made out of them at assemblies. They got awards for being helpful to the other kids. So both kids have to have a purpose. Not, you know, the tutor and the tutee, if that's what you call it, they both have to have instructional purposes. We can't take one child and say to them, you're so smart, you're so far ahead of your peers, we're going to put you in a tutoring situation without having some purposes for them, their own, their own learning objectives along the way. So every child has to have that learning objective. 
Um, planning for instruction, it's done together. We together plan for instruction. And I, I've done some team teaching and co-teaching co at the university with faculty who are preparing teachers in other areas, so like elementary ed. So we, we co-teach and then we come up with plans. And it's very important that we put everything out there ahead of time because when somebody comes in and brings something up that we haven't discussed its implications, all of a sudden I'm rattled. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I, where I'm at. I don't know what materials to go to next. So making sure that you have those um, agreements ahead of time. Monitoring students' progress. How are we going to do that? Who's going to do that? How often are we going to do it? What are we going to actually monitor? What parts of the instruction are we going to monitor? So we're clear about what all that is. Establishing a co-teaching relationship. So in the beginning, we're going to create a co-teaching team. We're going to have a co-teaching team. Or maybe we're going to have multiple co-teaching teams. By the way, those of you that are writing down these slides, they're all available. The slides from the previous presentation and this one, they're on that, say it again, Edmodo. Thank you. I don't say it right. I want to say Edmundo. Edmundo. <laughs> it's Edmodo. Um, and you can download them and use them however you want. Um, but I also can appreciate the fact that some people are writing. Because I remember going to PTA meetings and the treasurer would put up like the treasurer report and I'd be writing it down. Because you know when you're a student so long, <laughs> you kind of have that behavior of writing down whatever's on the screen no matter what. OK, then there's the negotiations, establishing co-teaching goals. What are our goals? Do we have common goals? Do we share those common goals? Have we even talked about those goals so that we can actually spend some time talking about them and sharing them? What are our expectations and what about our roles? You know, there are just some scenarios that I don't feel as comfortable doing. And so if we are co-teaching, I can put that on the table. And it so happens maybe my partner feels really comfortable doing that. For example, when I was a teacher, I hated bulletin boards. I hated everything about it. I worked in a school where, I don't know if you remember this, Janice, but I worked in a school where bulletin boards were a big deal. And, and t there was like this like non-spoken competitive thing that went on, you know? And I had no interest or desire to do bulletin board. Like, like I'm talking fancy, you know, thematic, you know, Halloween and then Christmas and Thanksgiving. And I, that's not my talent. That's not my interest. So when I would look for co-teachers, in my case, it was paraeducators. I looked for people that actually had those skills and those, and those dispositions and those desires to want to do that. So yeah, so Patty always did my bulletin boards. Um, setting demands. Develop a shared understanding of grade level, age level, developmental level, classroom expectations, and students' needs. So making sure that we both have a clear understanding of what the expectations are for the children so that we're both on the same page. And if there's differentiation in how we actually have expectations for kids, that we're clear about that ahead of time. Remember when I talked earlier at lunchtime about the criterion of the least dangerous assumption, you know, that we really need to be careful that even if a student isn't reading, that doesn't mean we don't give them literacy available to them. I, I, what, one of the things that makes me most crazy is I would go out to see student teachers who are working with, now this is K-12 for the most part, who are working with kids with moderate to severe disabilities, and I would say, where are the written words? There are no... There's no written words anywhere in your classroom. And they say, well, the kids don't read. I said, you're making a guarantee that they never will read. <laughs> you know, how dare us to stop that, to, sh to, to step in and say they're never going to read, so why would we give them any words to read? We, we, we need to label everything. And the more they're not reading, the more we should be using literacy as a way to en enliven the classroom. OK. Identify an individual student's needs. Review and discuss students' IEPs. Not wait until somebody comes in and says, you haven't worked on my son's IEP goals. Maybe start by identifying, putting out there. And you know what? Giving a, a, a general ed teacher a 32-page IEP where you can't even figure out where the goals are listed. Are you following me with this? Because different districts use different formats. There was an attempt in California to actually have a statewide 
IEP and districts flipped out because, oh my gosh, we love our IP form. We don't, it's all the same law. I mean, we should have a federal form because it's all the same information no matter where. But anyway, we don't have it that way. It, I have a hard time, and I've looked at hundreds and hundreds of IEPs, sometimes finding the critical information, the essential information, which in a co-teaching relationship, the essential information would be what? I, I need a microphone. Where's a microphone? Because we can't do this without a microphone. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, who knows what we want to make sure that we include in the information? This lady has her hand up right here with the sparkly, pretty stuff. <laughs> You would make sure to have the present levels of the student, the IEP goals, and any accommodations that they may need. Great. So let me talk about present level. What does that mean? Nobody uses that terminology except special ed. So yes, that's what it's going to probably be called in the IEP, but let's give it a label that is more generally understood like assessment information or the child's development um, of where he's at. You know, the present level of performance is just such a mouthful of jargon that, and, and I, I, by the way, I think it's a jargon for parents too. I don't think they actually always understand that that present level performance is in fact what we talk about in terms of where the student is at. So use terminology that's helpful. I say make a cheat sheet. Take what you just said, you know, the present level performance information, the goals and objectives and accommodations and adaptations that have been delineated in the IEP. Take those three pieces of information, create a data sheet that does whatever, lists it out, streamlines it to one page, just one page. And if the IEP objectives have 45 words in them, try to see if you, because that's how long it took the IEP team to construct those words, try to see if you can't without losing its essence, without losing its actual meaning, try to see if you can't come up with a more, cons a, a more concise statement about what you're trying to work toward. Then, that's what you give the, the general education teacher. I, I mean, I'm, I have no problem giving them the, a copy of the IEP, but frankly, I think it's not necessarily that useful. I think it's too cumbersome, too much information that you don't even need to worry about because it's not really part of. Um, it might be helpful to know services if you're going to have, if the kid's getting speech therapy a couple of times a week, either in the classroom or pull out, that we have that information identified. You're going to look at the IEP and you're going to say, what would be really important for this general ed teacher to know about? Now, and again, I'm not saying don't give them the IEP <laughs> because if they want it, give it to them. But know that that may not be the most communicative in uh, context. And, document that would help them to really understand what it is they're going to be able to do to incorporate the students' needs and, and, and objectives along the way. Review and become familiar with the general education preschool level standards. So know what those are. Um, I actually think preschool teachers, preschool special ed teachers are more knowledgeable and more familiar, is this true for you guys too, than, than K-12. I think K-12 teachers special ed teachers are not as familiar with the, the, the standards. And you know, right now everybody's flipping out because we got Common Core coming and you know, even though in general it's probably a really good thing for us to have Common Core come for kids with and without disabilities, the process by which it's being un unfolded, at least in Southern California, when I talk to my, my friends and colleagues that are teachers, is leaving a little bit to like, oh my gosh. How am I going to know what to do? So we got textbooks that aren't available that don't support the notion. We have lesson plans and whatever that aren't supporting it. But aside from that, I think really having a good handle on what are the preschool goals and objectives for preschool in general and making sure that, and I'm not saying the right thing because I forget what it's called. Foundation. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Foundations for preschool. Develop student goals for accessing the preschool curriculum. So what we're going to do in the beginning is actually share the IEP information, which will have some of that. But the next time there's an IEP, there needs to be input from the general ed preschool teacher who, uh, into the goals and objectives. I'm, it, it makes sense that there's going to be that kind of input because they've now gotten to know the child and they have a much better sense of what the child's needs are. 
And then consider differentiation accommodations and modifications. There's a lot of misunderstanding about these terms. I'm going to probably need the microphone again because I want to get people's input on this. So um, who wants to take a venture to actually let us know what's the difference between modifications and accommodations? Who has a good handle on that? Or a reasonable handle on it? Doesn't have to be a good handle. Anybody? Oh my gosh. OK, we got somebody over here. Wave before you answer so we have a microphone. It's important to know these distinctions because these terms get used interchangeably all the time and they don't mean the same thing. Uh, for me, I think the accommodations are the tools that you use in order to help the child access the learning that they need. And then the modifications are the actual strategies that you use to get the child to master whatever um, skill it is that you want them to do. OK, so here's what I would say to that. I got another hand up here. But here's what I'd say to that. That's probably true when you use the lowercase a and lowercase m for accommodations and modifications. But as far as legally what we're doing, let's see if we can get somebody else. It's this lady right here. Well, modifications can actually change the, the criteria. And accommodations are the supports that right. help you reach. Right, right. So accommodations. We're not changing the performance standards. I'll give you the simplest example. A kid uses a wheelchair. He takes the wheelchair, and he uses the elevator to get to the second floor where the preschool classroom is. That's merely an accommodation. We haven't changed the performance standards. Getting to the classroom is the, is the goal, and he's arrived at the, at the preschool classroom, so he's there. A modification would be where we actually change the performance standards. And so we actually do something different. So give me an example. I'll need somebody to um, raise their hand. Give me an example of one of the preschool foundation. What is it called? Preschool foundation. 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 Yeah, okay. yeah. Give me an example. No, you don't have an example? I was going to give an example of what, what you had just said about the wheelchair. I was just going to say if it was a race to the classroom and he had you know, turbocharged batteries on his wheelchair. That and he would be won. a modification yeah. he won. That would be a modification. Good. I want a preschool example of a preschool foundational skill. Somebody tell me something you're working on or have worked on. Now, come on, you guys are preschool people, aren't you? No. What are you? Your primary. OK, we can use a primary example. Wait, 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 wait. Demonstration of empathy. OK, so demonstration of empathy. What is that going to look like And I'm gonna, so that I'm going to know the child is actually doing that? What's it going to look like? Well, one of the examples that's on the foundations is something to the effect of a peer falls down, and they go over to pat their back, or they get a teacher. OK, all right. So that's the goal, that's the goal we're looking at. Now let's talk about that as an accommodation and a modification. Given the definition that this lady, what's your name? Renee. Renee provided us, what would be an accommodation and what would be a modification to that particular goal? Oh, come on, class. Is it late? Because it's like after lunch and there's no caffeine in the room. <laughs> Somebody raise your hand. Come on. OK. Thank you. What's your name? I'm, my name's Hannah. I, Thank maybe, you, Hannah. Maybe like an accommodation would be like um, a, a, a small prompt from a teacher if they see a student fall, um, whereas a modification might be, well, they're not going to like pat them on the back, but they're going to be able to like look at them and acknowledge that they had okay. Okay. fallen. So that might be, you can give it to her. Um, that might be an accommodation or a modification. Let's come up with another um, development foundation. I'm not saying the right words. Um, I mean, I know K-12 so much better. Oh, come up with a K-12 example, an academic example, not a social skill, just like a kindergarten thing. Sequencing the story, okay? That's, that's her example. Is that a good one, you guys, you elementary teachers over there? 
sequencing the story. Doesn't matter what kind of a book it is, it's sequencing the story. So um, um, what would be an accommodation and what would be an, a modification for sequencing the story? Wait, 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 you need the microphone because the, the people who are, but hi guys, by the way, yeah. who are someplace else, uh, lots of someplace else's, by the way. So a, a accommodation might be that you give a visual support um, and then like a modification would be the, the results of that they don't have to give all the components yeah. of the. So, so what she's saying is the accommodation might be that, that, that all the kids have um, the sequence of the story written out and then there maybe their lines or they put numbers next to it to say this is the first thing that happened this is the second thing that happened this is the third thing that happened and a modification might be where they only have two they only like let's say that, that for the kids that have the accommodation there's seven steps to the story but for a kid who's got a modification maybe it's only two are you all following me with that I really want you to understand that. Let me just do a quick, brief little scenario here. It's not a big deal in preschool, and it's not even really a big deal in elementary school, but it starts to become a bigger deal in middle school, and it's a huge deal in high school. So when, when we do accommodations um, and, for a student throughout their schooling years, you know, preschool all the way through their senior year of high school, and we make notations on their report cards that we've done accommodation, we're actually violating their rights. And let me give you the example for that. Um, a number of years ago, there was a, a couple of kids who had learning disabilities who took uh, the SAT test. And they took it with extra time. I don't really remember what the actual accommodations were, but they were accommodations. They were not modifications. They took it with accommodations, and a notation was made on their SAT score results. Now, even though the universities and colleges they were applying for were not supposed to take that into consideration, you and I both know that they probably did. I mean, when they're, when they're faced with all these applications and they have to exclude some, any, any reason to exclude, they're going to look for things to exclude. So that they were sued on the basis that that information should never have been shared. Um, there were also a couple of kids who had applied to the military to get into the military after high school. And again, their transcripts indicated that they had some kind of supports along the way. And when in retrospect you looked at the supports that they had, they were accommodations, not modifications. They should not have been written on there because they were actually denied access to the military. All that ended up in lawsuits and blah, blah, blah. So we need to be really careful with that, that we don't make notations on report cards or any other kind of document that's an official document that describes a particular student. Are you with me on that? Again, it's not a big deal in preschool because who reads? I mean, first of all, are there even report cards in preschool? There's usually progress reports. And who reads them but the parents and the teachers? That's all whoever reads them. But, and the same thing is at an elementary school. Hardly anyone else would read them except for just the parents and the teachers. But as they get older, those things are really important that you take that into consideration, okay? And lastly, discuss potential problems and possible solutions before they arise. So there is a preschooler in my class who I know that when the fire alarm goes off, he flips out. Anybody have a student who might <laughs> exhibit that behavior? Yeah, that's a pretty common thing. So I might need to go to the principal or the director, whoever's running this program, and just say it's going to be really important. I know teachers are not and kids are not supposed to know when there's going to be a fire drill because we're supposed to be, you know, but I have a student who it'll take three days to get him off the wall. Um, if I don't have a little bit of warning, something, I can put a set of headphones on him, something. So having that kind of conversation ahead of time and communicating with the administration but also with the co-teacher so that there's a better sense, so that kids are better prepared for those kind of circumstances. Are you with me on that? And I know some people are going to be really reluctant and resistant to giving you that information. But if you can kind of explain it in the more humane way that 
you know, this is going to be, and not only will he have difficulty, but his behavior will probably result in everybody else in the class also falling apart and having difficulty. Okay. The language of us and they, um, a wonderful guy who actually just passed away not too long ago, Mary, Mayor, Mayor Shevin, wrote this poem. And he wrote this poem as a way to kind of think about how we use different language sometimes to define students with disabilities versus students who don't have disabilities. So just listen to this. We like things. They, referring to the students with disabilities, they fixate on things. So you've got a kid who's fixated on some toy when in fact we would just say if he, went, if he didn't have autism, we would say he just likes it. So sometimes our language actually further disables a child by taking it and actually making it more deviant than it necessarily needs to be. We try to make friends, they display attention seeking behaviors. We take a break and they display off task behaviors. How dare them? We stand up for ourselves, and they are non-compliant. So we start an ABA program now, implementing all of the consequences because, yeah. Um, we have hobbies, they self-stim. I remember having a student come to class one night. He was a brand new teacher. And um, he was, you know, remember the days when we didn't have enough teachers, so we just hired anybody who could breathe it, it, off the street to be a teacher, a special ed teacher? So this poor guy, he had no experience at all. He comes to class one day and he goes, I just got a Kim folder for a student who, it says he's a stimmer. What does that mean? <laughs> like, it's a terrible word. Don't use it. <laughs> we choose our friends wisely. They display poor peer socialization. <laughs> you know, maybe they're making choices. We persevere, they perseverate. Persevere is a great thing. Perseveration is one of those deviant kinds of behaviors. We love people. They have dependencies on people. We go for a walk. They run away. I'm like, that's another word that makes me crazy. I go into a school and they say, well, we have a metal gate here because we have a runner. Well, isn't that great that your students know how to run? That's great. We insist they tantrum. Perseverate is where you, you over and over do the same thing. You just continue to do the same thing. But it's the, it, it could be like a good thing, you know, because if you're over and over doing something to practice it, it's a good thing. We insist they tantrum. We change our minds. They're disoriented and have short attention spans. <laughs> we have talents. They have splinter skills. <laughs> there's, there's another word. There's another special ed word. Like, what is a splinter skill? You know, I'll, I'll, I'll be at an IEP meeting and I'll say, somebody will say, well, this student doesn't really have all the skills. He just has splinter skills. Well, aren't those part of the skills for that, like, that task? Like, why do we have to have another word? Why did we create another word to kind of define a, a subset of those? OK. Uh, and then the last one, which is not funny, we are human, they are. Question mark, question mark, question mark. And he's putting out, I mean, it's obviously very facetious, but he's putting out there this notion that we should be very careful not to create a separate language. And so when a general ed teacher asks me what is one of those words, like a splinter skill or a stimming, it really reminds us to say stop using those words. Just use regular words. Just use words that you would use with any child, because the more we use a different language, a different set of vocabulary, the more we actually create that schism between kids with and without disabilities. OK, planning for instruction. Co-teaching is most effective when teachers have a designated time to plan. That's like the, the most sacred thing of all. How do you figure out where do you do the planning? I hear preschool teachers or primary elementary teachers say, we do planning while the kids are napping, because <laughs> it's the only time we can. Well, they're talking, so now the kids aren't napping, because <laughs> they're talking and keeping the kids up. Um, so when do you, those of you that raised your hand and said you were planning, you ready to go with the microphone? Um, those of you that, when do you co-plan? When, when, in your structure of your day, when do you co-plan? Right, we have somebody right here. Um, my co-teacher and I, we don't have any time to co-plan. You have no time. And lunch. the district lunch, but that's often when I'm, we're getting stuff done that needs to happen because we teach two sessions a day with an hour in between. But it's something the district is working on. 
They know it's a need. Okay, so it's not available right now, but they know it's important. Anybody else? Do, yeah, Dale. Well, you have to use the microphone because we have we're recording it. Um, I'm not co-teaching now, but when I did co-teach, and this may not be popular with some folks, but we did do it during our lunch time because we realized that was the, and we we did it once a week, and we made sure we used that time as efficiently, but we valued it enough that that was what we chose to do. So, and it worked for us. So, and that's choices. That's choices people get to make. And so four days a week, you still got to have your lunch, whatever that might mean to each of you. But one day a week, you made a decision to do the co-planning. What else? What other exa examples? We have one right over here. Um, this year we just started getting um, early release Mondays and so our kids go home early and we get to collaborate okay and is that every Monday or is that so every Monday okay because I know school some year. schools will do that but they'll have like a, a full faculty meeting one Monday um, the first Monday of the month say and then they might have like grade level meetings another Monday but then there's co-planning time for one of the money so it's it's whatever email is a big deal Big deal in co-planning, assuming you are comfortable with email, because frankly, sometimes teachers get brilliant ideas at 3 o'clock in the morning, and you don't want to get a phone call at 3 o'clock in the morning. So instead, uh, hopefully a less, a less intrusive conversation is, is something that happens on email. We have a hand over here. Hold on. Don't lose your thought. <laughs> Uh, the co-teacher and I uh, have time and we work with another teacher in the RTI program. And so we try to do that once a month where she will meet specifically like with each team member. Mm -hmm. And so my co-teacher and I, we get together on a designated day and then we can actually for like, you know, 30 minutes, an hour, Is it sit after down. the students leave or how does that work? Uh, it's usually mid, it's usually midday. For me, um, I teach part-time, so uh -huh. it's usually a day where I'll have to come in early or sometimes, depending on what their schedule is, they may block off a whole day and just spend it at a particular site and then it's scheduled, so sometimes it could be early in the morning, which I would come early, or it might be early afternoon, like 12 or something like that, and I would come in early, and then my teacher and I, we would sit down together specifically and you know address children that may have existing IEPs, but then that's also the time where we can discuss children that we are seeing that are showing signs of a struggle in a particular mm -hmm. area, and then they kind of, no, that's sort of like how we get them on the radar to, you know, this is a child that we think needs extra support or what others, these are the skills and strategies we've been trying. It hasn't worked. What suggestions do you have? Good. So you remember when, um, oh, actually, you might not have been at this session, but in Witt's session, when he was doing, um, he was talking about reflection, how important reflection is. This is as important as reflection. So it's figuring out where and when it can actually happen. I know teachers who plan to have breakfast um, one day a week or you know one day a month, and they meet at 6 to have breakfast to do their co-planning at that particular time. I know that doesn't sound very appealing, especially if you have children that can't be dropped off, your own children who can't be dropped off at their daycare centers or their schools that early in the morning. But it's just sitting down and saying, what can we do? Where can we carve out? some time that we can agree upon will be our time. And then what if something comes up at the last minute that we have to talk about? We can't, we can't wait. What's our other mechanisms that we can use to get that kind of conversation? And sometimes it's gonna be just a hallway conversation. Frankly, and I think we only have one male in here, so frankly, in the women's bathroom <laughs> sometimes. Sorry, you don't get to go in there. <laughs> But looking for the planning time is really, really important. Um, Co-teaching is of great concern when teachers do not share common planning time. And so it's, it's carving it out in whatever way possible. It's talking to administrators and helping administrators understand the importance of that co-planning time so that you can do that kind of planning. So some of the do's and don'ts of co-teaching. Of co um, 
So talk about classroom matters, absolutely. Treat co-teaching as a partnership, not a marriage. Doesn't have to be, you don't even have to like each other, frankly. You just have to respect each other. That's the bottom line is you have to respect each other. But to think about it as a partnership. Make time to discuss, we talked about that. Discuss accommodations of students. Consider co-teaching every other day, maybe. Maybe co-teaching in the beginning is too much to try to do every day. So, Figure out a schedule that does it in a way that works. Pay attention to the minor but important details of sharing classroom space. That gets back to whose materials are these, who's paid for these things, and can we exchange them and use them interchangeably. And then some of the things on the don't list, don't use a single approach for co-teaching. I'm going to talk about some different approaches for co-teaching in a little bit, but don't use the same approach. Don't set unrealistic expectations. I mean, there's nothing more frustrating than having a lesson plan that really is a four-hour lesson when you only have 20 minutes. So try to see if you can't balance in so that you have uh, realistic expectations. Don't treat co-teaching as an add-on service. It really has to be something that we agree upon we're going to do. It's not the Friday afternoon at 2.30. It's, it's really something that happens. Uh, don't expect special ed teacher to work just with the students with disabilities. So really helping the general ed teacher feeling more comfortable to interact with the student who has a disability. And that won't happen the first week, maybe not even the first month. But each time you co-teach and you co-plan and you co-execute the lesson, each time is more opportunities for teachers to build relationships with students. Frankly, when, as a special ed teacher who always worked with kids with really significant disabilities, I'm way more intimidated by non-disabled kids. They talk. <laughs> they tell you what they think. <laughs> it's overwhelming sometimes. <laughs> so the opposite is true, too. OK, um, create shared planning time we talked about. The benefits for both the general and special education teacher is professional satisfaction. Um, I frankly think that um, co-teaching is probably one of the most important interventions we could do around accountability. It's so much easier when I close my door and I'm all by myself to slough off, to maybe not do my best. But when I have a co-teacher in there with me, all of a sudden I'm being held accountable to an adult. Because I might think the kids won't notice. But the adult's probably going to notice if I'm sloughing off. Professional growth, it's an opportunity to both grow in ways that together they can create a, a, a better atmosphere. Um, personnel support, shared learning, shared ownership. So co-teaching models, um, I wonder if this has this. Oh, there it is. OK, good. OK, so this particular, can you see my little red dot? Can the people? Can you see it on the screen? No, you can't. OK, then I'm going to point to them. So this particular model, these are supposed to be children in desks. I don't know that that really depicts it very well. But in this model, what you see is that there's one teacher at the front of the classroom. There's another teacher at the back of the classroom who's kind of just watching to see where she or he might need to intervene. Where do you need to get in there? So that's the one teaching, one observing. And observing means also intervening where necessary, OK? That's the most common model that I see in the beginning of co-teaching. Because special ed teacher is a little reluctant to actually teach sometimes the curriculum. And the general ed teacher is a little more uncomfortable doing those individual interventions, especially for the kids that are on her caseload. <laughs> so that's often the common one. Now what you want to do, remember what I said earlier, don't use one model. So you want to get out of just that model. There's station teaching. This would be where we have three different stations in the classroom. Perhaps we have an instructional assistant. So all three stations are covered by an adult. Or we have three stations. We have two adults. And one station can be done more independently. The instructions are clear. What the students have to do, they understand what the lesson is. So that station actually is done without adult supervision, while the other two stations might need a lot more supervision. And some of this is just kids getting used to how that norm actually plays out. So maybe in the beginning, they're not so able to do anything independently. But as they have more experience at it, they're able to do that. And then parallel teaching is where, let's just say I would divide the class in half right down the middle of the room. And I'm going to push 
desks over here, and, and she's going to be teaching this half of the class, and I'm going to be teaching that half of the class. The advantage of that is that general ed teachers will probably end up with fewer students than they're used to having. Are you following me with that? And special ed teachers will end up with more students, but they will include social, you know, more age-appropriate social communicative academic behaviors because now they have students who are on grade level or so or they're developmentally um, consistent with that age group. And then um, we have alternate teaching. So you might have students that are kind of going along with the curriculum, going along with the plan, but there's a couple of students who need some more remediation. They need a little bit more help in drilling in whatever you're working on. So it's not actually splitting the class in half, it's taking the kids and doing some more intention. This may not be done every day of the week, but it might be done on Tuesdays or whatever. And then um, the, the teaming where we teach together. And that's kind of fun to do. Um, it's got to be organized, though, because otherwise you'll trip over each other, right? You'll, like, who, who's doing what parts? So having the team teaching opportunity to actually, bless you, to actually have that opportunity to have two different people presenting the lesson, but not simultaneously. They're taking turns at, at doing the instruction. And then the last group would be one teaching, one assisting, which is kind of similar to one observing up there. So the, the sixth one and the first one are kind of similar. Those are the models that have been written about in the literature, that there's books on them, there are courses on them, there are webinars on the six models of, um, of uh, co-teaching that exists. So those are kind of the options you have, and there's many variations within those options. So this is not just six single options. And in any one lesson, you might move from one to another in a pretty fluid manner, because some things call for a certain model, like more logical certain model, while other lessons, other activities call for a different model. OK? Everybody with me? OK, where to start? So I, I said earlier, start small. If you haven't started at all, I know a number of you have already said you started. You know, start small. Do it on Friday afternoons <laughs> when everybody's kind of burnt out. It might make a more motivating Friday afternoon activity. Um, select teachers who have a track record, if there is such a thing. I, I frankly think select teachers who have an agreement that this is, they share that value. They think it's an important piece. Um, we require that all of our student teachers who are going through the special ed credential program, that they do a collaborative teaching assignment. And it's always so interesting because they're so stressed out. You know, first of all, they're already a brand new, they're a brand new presence on that campus because they're student teachers. So they're not, it's not the campus they, if they've been in instructional aid, it's not the campus they've been working at. So now there's a whole new set of, um, in, you know, people on that campus. So I was out in school um, on Monday and it's an elementary school, and the, the, I said, so when are you, when are you going to do your collaboration? Because we're at midterm now. We're on the quarter system, so we're halfway through the quarter. So I said to the student, and I said it in front of the master teacher, I said, when are you going to be doing your collaborative assignment? She goes, well, we got a kid included in first grade, because that was the excuse to get him included in first grade. Like, whatever it takes, you know? <laughs> so now they're going to start doing this collaborative teaching assignment. And what I see happening is, once it gets established, it doesn't usually go away unless the players change. And when the players change, then it might actually change. But if the players stay the same, it's, it's a way to kind of step in there and get your foot in the door. Integrate planning time into teacher schedule. We talked about that. Attend professional development with partners. How many here are here with you two are partners, aren't you? Are you two partners? I was just seeing that it looked like you were partners. Did anybody else have a collaborative partner here, a co-teaching partner? So we only have one, so you guys are our example. Who's, who's special ed? Who's general ed? She, you're special ed, you're general ed. All right. Oh, we have some online. Great. Good job, online. Good job. <laughs> um, ensure that teachers have sufficient blocks of time in class to work together. Collect student progress data. Review it together. Look at the student progress data together. It informs in so many ways. And, and conduct periodic evaluations of the co-teaching. Look, there's some really nice evaluation forms that are online that you can use to actually evaluate. It's just a self-evaluation. It's not having somebody come in to evaluate. It gives you a chance to sort of see, is there, are there things we could do more or different? And then what do paraprofessionals do? 
provide instructional job coaching or other services supervised by the cert certificated teacher. So when you have a para, mo do you have a para, para educator? One or two? I have one. You have one? Has an oh, and you have one too. Oh, so that's great. Because then you're both used to having somebody that you're preparing for. You're, you're de when you're developing your lessons, you're preparing for. Sometimes general ed teachers haven't had that experience of having somebody they're preparing for. So recognizing that and giving them some tools and some strategies for how to actually plan for not just the teacher's role, but also for the paraeducator's role. Issues related to paraeducators. So sometimes, Paraeducators are absent of a job description. And especially when you move into a co-teaching arrangement, because now it's a different job description than it might have been when you were individually having your paraeducators working for you. So being really clear, and I don't mean a job description that HR approves of. I'm talking about a functional job description that gives the paraeducators a clear idea of what it is they're being expected to do, and at what time, where should they be, and what should they be doing, and also having a pretty good sense of what the students' needs are. Um, nothing sends me more over the edge when I hear people say things like, bad girl, bad, good girl, or bad boy, good boy, because it's the whole essence you're talking about. And sometimes that just takes some training to help people understand that it's the action itself you want to be reinforcing. It's the action itself that you want to be correcting and turning into something else. So sometimes you have to do some of that kind of training along the way. Um, also, I see that paraeducators sometimes have poor supervision. Now, sometimes paraeducators have been there longer than the teachers. And so they actually have a, a, a pretty good understanding of what needs to be done. But that's what the teacher three teachers ago wanted to have done. This teacher might want it done differently. So it's giving a good boundary or parameter for that. Lack of ongoing support and training. Um, most of the time, the paraeducator's hours are set by the children's hours. So there is no opportunity for training because they go home at 3 or 2 or 12 or whatever time the children leave. And they get there exactly when the buses arrive or when the children are being dropped off um, so there's often not enough training. Um, and inadequate performance evaluation. What I see most districts using is so generic in, in form that it doesn't really get to the real, the, the real issues. So creating some, some forms that can be communicative, not necessarily for the purposes of evaluation, but for the purposes of program improvement. And lack, sometimes lack of respect as an educational community member. Probably one of the best things that I did when I was um, in my undergraduate program is I became a paraeducator. So I actually understood what the paraeducator's perspective was. And I try to encourage my students that are undergraduates, get a job as a paraeducator because you'll be a more respectful teacher probably with, that para, with your paraeducators in the future because you'll understand that role and um, be able to help out with that role. So issues of paraeducators' proximity. I'm sure you've heard about the Velcro syndrome or the hovercraft syndrome, um, where, and this is actually pretty common in inclusion because sometimes the IEP team will determine that in order for this student to be included in preschool or kindergarten or fourth grade, they need to have a one-to-one -one, um, instructional assistant. And so um, the one-to-one the -one sometimes becomes the person who's really responsible for teaching them everything that they need to learn. And now they're no longer learning from the general ed teacher because they're learning from the instructional assistant. It might initially be an interpretation issue, but over time then you see the general ed teacher talking to the aide instead of talking to the student directly and, and, and it discounts it. Um, it creates, in my opinion, for kids, a dependence on adults. And, um, you know, you need the extra pair of hands every once in a while, but sometimes that dependence on it. I was in a classroom a couple of weeks ago. You'll, you'll recognize this. Classroom of kids with autism. There are seven students in the classroom. There are eight adults in the classroom. I frankly would hate that. Managing eight adults, you know, like who, who have a whole range of having been the instructional aid, and I know everything there is to know, and I know what to do, and the teacher doesn't really know what to do, to uh, 
just here to have a good time. You know, let's just have fun and kind of everything in between. And so this poor teacher is spending, I think, more of his time managing these seven other adults than he, than he has to actually manage the class because we've gotten crazy on, especially in the area of autism, particularly in more wealthy communities. Have you noticed that? Like, the, like in East LA, you rarely see a one-on-one. -on -one. But in Beverly Hills School District, oh my god, almost all the kids with autism <laughs> have one-on-one. -on -one. Some have two assistants so to make sure that they're never like left alone, whatever. So it has more to do with that. Um, limitations on receiving competent instruction, interference with instruction of other students. So let's just take this group of people that are sitting right here and let's just say that Linda is the student in question and you're her instructional assistant. These are the other classmates here. If you sit in such a way that you're in the middle of it, it, it inhibits the interactions that could actually be going on. So being careful with that. Overuse of paraeducators, I, the Band-Aid approach, the hovercraft, um, the Velcro syndrome, just trying to back off. Paraprofessionals should be provided with the following. Opportunities to review the student's IEP, training, and, and training doesn't have to be like at 4 o'clock on Thursday afternoon. Training can be for a few minutes just to provide some information so they're not working in a vacuum. Opportunities to observe you. That's an interesting one because often what we do in the schedule is we have the paraeducator over here working with these three students while I'm the teacher over here working with these four students. So in order for her or him, the paraeducators, they have to do some time of doing some observing and watching how the teacher is actually um, unfolding the lesson. Uh, clear expectations uh, and providing feedback. Paraeducators should not write IEP. That's not the role of a paraeducator, uh, even though some of them feel like they should write the IEP. No, that's not their role. Interpret performance data. I mean, they can make a guess at what it might mean, but it's not the official interpretation. And the difficulty comes in when the parent shows up and the aide feels compelled to then tell the parent what happened when, in fact, that's not really officially what happened from the teacher's perspective. So being clear about who communicates with whom. Discontinue interventions or programs without direction. It's not their job. They can't say, I refuse to do this program anymore. This reading is not making sense to me. Uh, they need to have more training in that program. Design or deliver core instruction without teacher supervision. Make essential decisions without teacher supervision. Oh, wait, 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 oops. Okay. It's supposed to come on. There's a really wonderful video. It's not coming on. Let me go back a couple and see if, okay, come on, do it right, okay? Come on. Oh, it's so cute. All right, it's not working. Listening to hear, not listening to speak is my last message. What I wanted to do was to see about taking some questions at this point, and if there's questions that came in from the um, field. But we can start with questions in here. So we do need a microphone. She, here she comes. You have one you can start with. Okay, I'll start with this question. Right here. So the question is, how long have we as a nation been dealing with the issue of inclusion in schools? How long before we notice a change in the public school system? Wow, there's a loaded question. <laughs> I, I think I'm hearing the frustration on the part of this educator who is feeling that we've been doing this for a long time. Can we now just step up and start doing it right? Actually, just before the um, special ed director for CDE left, I got a chance to get his ear, and I said, we need leadership from the California Department of Ed, because those statistics that vary across states have to do with the fact that districts don't take this as seriously sometimes as others do. Some districts are very good and step up and make this happen. But um, yeah, we have, we've been dealing with this since 1975. I mean, probably informally since even before that. And most of the people that were in school in 1975 are long gone from schools, um, the students anyway. And so, yeah, we really have to make this happen.
I gotta remember what I believe. Um, it was a good one too. Can you get it? I believe that um, that when we start and do it well in school, it's very difficult to not have it implemented. Yeah. You can't hear me. Can't use that mic. Oh, that mic's not working. So can I use yours? Does this one work? Okay, there you go. Try again. Okay, let's go away. Okay, how about that? Can you hear me now? Okay, so I forgot what I was going to say, but it was along the lines of, um, yeah, when parents come in and haven't had a segregated experience, they're going to expect an inclusive experience. So they'll continue to advocate for it. Will all parents advocate for it? Probably not, because some parents just won't feel comfortable being in a confrontive position that they find themselves in when they're disagreeing with the school district. But we get to make many of those decisions ourselves. And so it's not up to somebody else. It's really up to us on a daily basis. So thank you for that question. Did we get any more from the community? We do have one from here. So I don't. Can we use this other microphone? That one works? OK. We can use this one. OK, so um, my name's Hannah. And right now, I'm co-teaching in a fourth grade classroom um, with two of my students are included. And they have more moderate to severe disabilities. And I, I think one of the biggest challenges that I face right now is that one of the students requires a pretty intense behavior reinforcement like every 30 seconds to a minute and so when we co-teach it feels more like we're like tag teaming between like one of us is managing that behavior and one of us is teaching so do you have any I don't know troubleshooting around that or, or so how long have you been doing this with this particular fourth grade teacher with those students um, just since like the beginning of the school year okay so recognize that that's important because that's we're still in the beginning. We're in October, so school probably started in August, yeah. sometime in August. So you're two months into the school year, maybe two and a half months into the school year. So I want you to recognize that growth happens sometimes slower than we'd like to see it happen. Um, the other thing I have seen teachers effectively use in those circumstances, and you just have to be really careful and do this carefully with a lot of dignity and respect, is to work with the other students in the class to also serve in that role of reinforcing. And it's also a really wonderful role for kids to be in. So that would be my best suggestion Thank at you. this point. OK, we got another question back here. I'm going to put this back on since it does seem to be working. Mary, I'm, I'm wondering about our credentialing are we, um, when I, I, you know, I came out a long time ago, um, but my experience was becoming a general education teacher and then getting additional um, credentialing to become a special yeah. ed teacher. Back in that day, then I went in with my own only special ed students. Now we have special educators being trained separate from general ed and we're about inclusive. Because um, my experience with co-teachers is people amazingly are, they're afraid to, they're, we're not used to having our practice public. Right. Um, and are, is the university and the state looking at our credentialing programs? Excellent question. Um, did, did the people on the satellite get that question? So I don't have to repeat the question, because that's a really good question. There is a special ed panel that is meeting with both California Department of Ed as well as um, um, C uh, the C California Commission on Teacher Credentialing. And they are revising the teaching credential program. Now, I only have rumor because I'm not on the panel and I can't speak from per firsthand experience. But my understanding is they're looking at a merged elementary special ed credential program, which makes sense. I don't know what the preschool stuff looks like yet, but at least they're looking at something merged on elementary and special education. We just, at Cal State LA, just got a grant to do a residency program. 
and it will be a merged multiple subject special ed credential program. So the students will take all their classes together. So when they're learning how to do reading, because that's one of the courses you take in elementary ed, they'll also be learning the special ed pedagogy at the same time. Um, and this, that will be true for all the core subjects. Um, and classroom management and all the other classes that they take as part of their credential program. So I think there's some, and then there's San Marcos, which has already emerged um, credential program and has had it for years that you, you, when you go through the San Marcos teacher credential program, you take the courses together, elementary and special ed, take it together. It's a little problematic and we haven't worked out a lot of the uh, barriers around um, special ed and secondary because what we do in elementary ed is not what it looks like for secondary. M middle schools are departmentalized, middle schools and high schools are departmentalized. Teachers are knowledge, really knowledgeable of a subject, but they're not, they're not the breath like an elementary teacher is. So I think there's still a lot of challenges around trying to figure out how to do the credential program in the single subject area when there's so many single subjects that you can't really probably expect the special ed teacher to get all of them, but how do we get some that you know we kind of put together. We also did put together a, um, an internal certificate program at Cal State LA that is for uh, uh, elementary and secondary teachers. And it's kind of a, it's a, a bunch of classes that helps them learn how to do accommodations, modifications, and become a general ed teacher that understands that a little bit better. I have a single subject social studies teacher in my um, moderate severe methods class right now who's in that certificate program. He really has no intention of ever becoming a special ed teacher, but he really wants to understand better. And so it's a, it's a choice certificate. So not everybody's gonna just jump in there and take it, but it's like four courses and it works pretty well on their resume. So when there aren't a lot of jobs out there and a principal's looking at you know, the different vita, they're looking at, well, who has a little bit of special ed background? So those are just some of the things I've seen going on. Yeah, we have a question right over here. Do we have any more from the community? Not one specific. Okay. Sort of a, on the same lines of the question that was posed earlier, but one question I have in particular, the transitional kindergarten, because mm -hmm. I'm a general ed teacher, and a lot of my background is also a little bit behavior. Um, my understanding is, is that they don't necessarily have um, an assessment that they adhere to. For example, with general ed, we have the desired results and things like that. So I'm wondering, how does that special ed component get translated there and the it, especially when there's no assessment, so then how do you know when the accommodations and modifications, what's working, what's not working, because I'm, I don't get any feedback. So you know, it depends on the teacher. Sometimes I may get feedback and they'll say, you know, what did you do when I'm experiencing X, Y, Z? So how did, what did strategies did you use for this? But sometimes I don't, and because they're not having an assessment, I, I don't know what tools or methods they're using to be able to assess how they're developing? Yeah, it's actually a really great question, and I would love if somebody else in the audience actually knew the answer to that question, because I'm clueless about that. I, I mean, that's a really good point that there's no context, no, no, no goals and objectives that they're being held responsible for. So we have somebody here who knows the answer, or at least can contribute to our understanding about it. It, it depends on, the, you would use a district assessment, uh -huh. just like you would for kinder, but unique to TK. Since TK is new, some districts haven't developed those. So TK is not kindergarten standards, because districts are not developing kindergarten standards as much as they are relying upon the state standards for kindergarten, but we don't have statewide TK standards is what you're saying, yeah? So for TK, the preschool, the California Preschool Learning Foundations and the frameworks go all the way to 60 months. Oh. So that's one thing that TK teachers can access oh. and very, very much so developmentally appropriate that's for special great. educators. The desired results system also has the DRDP SR, school readiness, that is again very appropriate as an observation tool for the TK population. Okay, so those are at least two ideas that can be used. And there's another hand right over here. 
I'm so happy we have all these knowledgeable people in the audience. Um, I think in an ideal world, we're creating um, IEP objectives as well that are transition or um, inclusion objectives. So that would be another way to measure right, whether right. or not what you're doing, the modifications are. But you're anchoring helping. the IEP objectives on some context, and it sounds like we could be using some of the context of the existing preschool curriculum, and we can also do the readiness piece for getting ready for kindergarten. So we're really clear about what does it take to be a successful kindergartner. Because that's the whole point of the TK program, is to create success there. Do we have any more questions? Or, or, or comments to make? Thanks, Meredith. Uh, I just wanted to comment something you said earlier. I have been doing some specific research in co-teaching and did a slew of teacher interviews last spring. Oh. And one of the things, and this was high school, so not preschool, ah. but one of the things that they pretty regularly commented on was that having a co-teaching partner made them a better teacher. Yeah. Pretty much every Anecdotally, I hear that all the time. I, th I think that's very, very true. And I know from my own co-teaching experience at the university made me a much better teacher um, because I didn't have all the information. I got gotcha. you. I didn't have all the information that, that between us we had because it, it was a greater context. Yeah, there's, there's some really nice outcomes going on with the co-teaching. A lot of the universities are going to a co-teaching model for their student teachers. So instead of using the old, like, I'm going to evaluate you, and you're my student teacher, and you're going to do all the grant run stuff, you're going to actually do the whole co-teaching piece. And I think it's a much better model um, you know, that, that we have going. I think that's a, that's a really big improvement in our student teaching experience. Well, I'm glad to hear that. And anybody else? Comments? All the way in the back of the room. Boy, you're, you're getting your exercise, aren't you? <laughs> OK. Did you write it down? Um, I just wanted to throw out there that last year I was doing this. Um, I'm in special ed. I was a special day class teacher, um, and I my students were fully included within general education, and we co-taught daily. Um, and all the same grade or multiple grades? It was second and third grade, uh -huh. so it was a variety. Um, but the the amount of involvement that the parents felt once their children were part of the community and no longer isolated made just the whole community grow, and it was just a huge change that was really powerful. I love, love, love that. Yeah, it's a, that's a big deal. I know that um, you know, my, my sister has often felt like one or two steps removed from what's going on because there was, the, you know, there was the meetings that were specific to special ed, but then there was the PTA meetings and all the PTA stuff that goes on. So yeah, that's a really good point. I think we have one question from the... I think it's, a, it's from yeah. earlier in the uh, presentation. Okay. We have time for one more question. We're going we're gonna to use this one right here from the community. Can you acknowledge that if a student has modifications, their report card would reflect such, yes, through a modified grade? OK, so I didn't follow that conversation all the way through. I'm so glad you asked this question. I was focused more on when there are accommodations, no notation should be made. But just as important, there should be a notation made when there's a modification. Because when a grade, when you look at a grade for like, let's say, third grade reading, the presumption is that that's third grade reading. There aren't any modifications to the third grade reading standards. If you've made modifications to the third grade reading standards, it is important to make that notation so that that information is communicated effectively. It's not a big deal, again, in preschool or elementary school, but it starts to become a bigger deal in middle school and high school. So thank you for reminding me to go back to finishing that conversation. And I think we have run out of time. We are at the end. Thank you all so much for coming and hanging in there for this very long day. Thank you, Mary, very much. Thank you. Thank you.